Hello and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the University of East Anglia, in collaboration with the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures. I'm your host, Oliver Moxon, Project Coordinator at Center for Japanese Studies and Researcher of Japanese War Heritage. This week we are joined by Dr. Nadine Willems, Lecturer in Japanese History at the University of East Anglia, who will be discussing political dissent during Japan's modernization period. We will be exploring the grievances of dissenters and the kind of censorship and repression they had to confront. Nadine will also explain the place of anarchism as an anti-capitalist ideology in the early 20th century and how it was informed by foreign intellectual trends as well as indigenous traditions. We will then finish by illustrating the role of poetry as a way to raise awareness about the plight of the Ainu community in northern Japan in the 1930s. We hope you enjoy the show. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to start off by looking at how you've entered Japanese studies, as you seem to have a rather unusual uh, path into the into the field. Well, thank you first for um, having me today. I'm uh, very happy to be with you, talking about my research and experience. So I'm originally from Belgium, where I got an undergraduate degree in law. But back then, I, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to become a lawyer or not. So I decided to travel before embarking on a specific career. And I ended up in Japan, in Tokyo, precisely. And uh, I lived there for 20 years. Uh, I did all sorts of jobs, translator, language teacher, human resources assistant for a big Japanese import-export firm. And for a while, I even worked as a financial analyst for a British stockbroker. And then for several years, I was a foreign correspondent and later a freelance journalist writing for Belgian, French and Japanese publications. So academia to me happened much later. I returned to Europe, settled in the UK and went back to studying, getting my PhD from Oxford in 2015. Wow, so you've had a very diverse background with all sorts of experiences. Um, how do you feel this has changed your approach to your understanding of modern Japan? Well, I, I think that it influenced me in two ways. I mean, first, the experience of working in various jobs and different sectors of activity has me today to see historical events in a somewhat balanced way. I try to look at people's actions and motivations from a, a range of different perspectives. There is um, a tendency to simplify and pigeonhole events, but in fact, people are complicated and sometimes contradictory. Um, for example, I studied the popular agrarian movements of the 1920s and 30s in Japan. And very often we see those as the expression of a proto-fascist nationalist ideology, which ultimately led to war. And in that interpretation, everything falls into the category of rising Japanese militarism. And I found that it's not enough to explain the actions of farmers at, this, at the time solely by the appeal of a rightist ideology. And for one thing, there was no monolithic ideology of popular agrarianism. But we should say that there were several versions of agrarianism. Uh, farmers had a range of aspirations, and these were variously shaped by <clears throat> people's economic conditions, their social standing at the village level, access to education, even chance encounters uh, mattered. And there were several other aspects of their everyday lives that made them be and do what they be what they were and, and do what they they did and um, the the second way in which my previous experience makes a difference is how i look for and, and use individual voices when i worked as a journalist particularly i spent a lot of time talking to people whether for formal interviews or more casually to find out about some issues in which they were involved and I, I got used to listening to these individual voices. This is something I also try to do as a historian now, arriving at the understanding of historical processes through the lives of individuals. Um, that's one approach to researching history. But 
That's why also I like looking at memoirs, diaries and private correspondence. And I try to include these individual voices also when I write history. It sounds like your journalistic career in particular has had a strong influence on how you write history then. Yes, it it did and it does. And uh, as I say, there are several ways of writing history, but this is one that I feel particularly uh, close close to and familiar with. So it works for me. So could you tell us what you're working on at the moment? Is it uh, focusing on agrarian revolts or are you looking at other areas too? Well, um, actually, at the moment, I'm just now at the last stages of proofreading my book manuscript, which will be out with Leiden University Press in the autumn. And the book explores the life and intellectual journey of Ishikawa Sanshiro, who was a journalist and a non-violent anarchist, a prominent political dissenter of the modern period. Uh, He spent almost 10 years as an exile in Europe in the 1910s, and he was one amongst the few political dissenters who did not convert to the prevailing emperor-centered ideology before and during the war. And this is a book in which I indeed talk about uh, agrarian movements too, because Ishikawa was involved somehow with uh, one of these movements. But um, I'm also working on something completely different. I've been um, exploring Japanese travel accounts of the northern regions from Mm -hmm. Tohoku to Sakhalin and all the way to Siberia, in fact. And it so happens that I have been given recently private access by a family to the pictorial diary of a soldier who was sent to eastern Russia with the Japanese Imperial Army in 1920 in the context of the Siberian intervention. So I'm particularly interested in how a private individual, a simple soldier, perceived an event of major international significance, such as the uh, Siberian intervention. Sometimes we can't find in these types of sources what is never revealed in official documents. So I I really look forward to exploring this diary in more depth and, and detail. No, it sounds fascinating. I look forward to reading it. Um, but before we get into uh, the details of dissenting voices in Japan, would you mind giving us a uh, brief summary of the domestic political climate in Japan uh, from the Meiji era to the early Showa period? Well, mm, um, it, it seems to me that the answer to this question should take into account two separate dimensions. Um, one dimension one dimension has to do with the state and its institutions. So after the Meiji Restoration of uh, 1868, the state increasingly applied pressure on the population so that all efforts would be channeled into the construction of a modern nation state, that is a, a capitalist, industrial, centralized nation that could hold its own against Western powers. Uh, And the the government was extremely preoccupied with thought control and feared any ideas or political activists that threatened to derail the project of modernization it had assigned to its uh, citizens. So, of course, there were periods of relative relaxation, but overall, the political climate could be characterized by the molding of minds into obedience by the state and its low tolerance for dissenting views. So this attitude culminated during the 1930s and during the war. But the the other dimension concerns ordinary citizens. The so-called opening of Japan in the mid-19th century created a climate where many people were confronted to new demands and constraints on their daily life, but also new ideas and new ways of life. And there was a a growing thirst and curiosity in many sectors of society for these new trends. So I think inevitably there had to be some clashes between the state, which was fearful of derailment, and the aspirations of citizens, inspired one way or another by capitalist transformation. And if there was one historical juncture that mattered, it was the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Now we're already uh, in the Taisho period here, but its influence in Japan intensified this controlling tendency of the state while it galvanized the energy of political dissenters at the same time. Mm. 
Just to um, build on that idea of thought control that was prevalent in Japan during this time, um, the Meiji Revolution is often seen as a time where uh, European nations were helping Japan to develop into uh, an industrialized nation. Was this something which Japan was picking up from European politics at the time, or was this something that they were developing on their own? Well, if you talk about... um industrialization as such of course uh, there was a lot of import of uh, techniques and uh, ideas coming from uh, from from Europe uh, and, and America but it's never that clear that there's never a one-way uh, import and application of these ideas on on the home soil I think Japan was quite advanced in in some uh, technological aspects or in some work uh, ethics, for example, in some aspects of uh, work ethics, and that it managed to um, use these European or Western ideas um, by mingling it and uh, you know adjusting it to what they had already. Uh, mm-hmm. And you know, there's a, a, actually a very ongoing debate about how much these imports were, um, you know, imported into a vacuum or whether they actually completed what was already there and uh, to to let Japan flourish and to make Japan flourish and and develop as it did. Where does political thought control fit into that? Well, if you don't have a a workforce that is uh, extremely uh, obedient and uh, who does what is it's told and then um, you you have um, you know it's, it doesn't work as well. So that that was one thing. So the the, the state wanted to make sure that the workforce was uh, obedient and reliable. Uh, but also any uh, criticism of capitalism, because we're talking here about the about capitalist development. Any criticism, uh, for example, of uh, capitalist developments of private property, which uh, um, would be a way of criticizing capitalism or criticism of the emperor uh, system was seen as uh, dangerous and something that would derail that uh, process of industrialization and modernization. So that was um, feared by the state. Uh, Now, if we can move on to these dissenting voices in Japan, who were these people who were... uh, speaking out against these efforts by this by the state and uh, what exactly were they opposing well um the the dissenting voices of course were not the same at all times and they they can you know they conveyed uh, different claims during the meiji taisho and showa periods and and dissent took uh, different forms too but if, if there is one common thread that can be identified it has to do with the tensions created by by this rapid modernization we talked about. So um, the kinds of dissenting voices I have examined in my research belong to intellectuals who criticize the excesses of capitalism. Um, you know, a, a little bit actually the same kind of voices we hear uh, to- today. Um, and, and they took the side, these voices took, for example, the, sides, uh, the side of peasants burdened by heavy taxes, the side of industrial workers for, forced to live in dismal conditions by factory owners or uh, of citizens affected by industrial pollution. Um, the pollution caused in the countryside north of Tokyo by the Ashio copper mine at the turn of this, uh, the 20th century is one of these well-known events that inspired political protests and resistance in in the modern period. Now, um, if I can go on, I mean, there existed a tradition of dissent and critique of authority in Japan long before the modern period, but the import of foreign ideas after this so-called opening of the country and the blending of these ideas with homegrown concepts uh, colored political dissent in interesting and, and sometimes unexpected ways. And so uh, the contacts that many political dissenters nurtured with foreign radicals and intellectuals provided momentum to their their activism. And uh, whether this activism was in the form of organized strikes or the printing of anti-government pamphlets and so forth, 
Um, and Japanese activists also translated a range of foreign texts that they use for validation of their dissident views. One of the most curious of these translations, actually, is by anarchists in the early 1920s, and it's the translation of a book called Souvenir Entomologique by a French uh, entomologist, Jean-Henri Fabre. And in, this was a multi-volume description of the lives of insects. And uh, anarchists were taken by the idea that humans could learn from aspects of social organization in the world of insects. Mm. Um, you think about bees and ants, for example, and how they could offer a model of collective organization that humans could possibly learn from. So when I when I talk about dissent, uh, it, it really covers a whole range of activities, uh, writing anti-government pamphlets, but also translating uh, seditious text or text that were not going completely, that were not in line with uh, what the the government and the ruling elite wanted for, for Japan. I understand the diversity of uh, this topic and of course the broad time range we're looking at as well, uh, but could you give a couple of uh, key names amongst the centers of this time and what in particular they were opposing? Well, what, what uh, I have looking, been looking at are basically the, the centers that were part of the left uh, leftist uh, thought. Uh, and, you know, someone like uh, Kotoku Shusui is one of the, the better, known, um, better known dissidents because he was originally leftist, not, not clearly what kind of left, but he turned uh, as a, an anarchist. And he was um, executed, uh, tried and executed by the, the government in 1911 um, for alleged uh, conspiracy to kill the Emperor Meiji. So he, he's one of these famous figures of, of modern Japan. I mentioned um, Ishikawa Sanshiro earlier. He was less known, but also um, turned into an anarchist, although um, a, clearly a non violent anarchists and and of course the there was the, the communist party that was formed and and in 1922 and it immediately um banned so it had to run clandestinely i mean they, they were several figures but what what is interesting is that the, in the early 20th century just at the time of the russo japanese war there was really a curiosity for these uh, socialist anarchist ideas uh, from from the West, uh, but there was no clear, coherent ideology about this. It was really um, discontent about the way Japan was developing and the kind of inequalities, the kind of uh, uh, perceived oppression that uh, some people saw in that uh, development. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, would you say that these uh, efforts um Aside from these large key figures, um, would you say that, that, that uh, dissenting organizations were quite localized? Um, well, they were, I would say that intellectuals were at the, the core of their development. Intellectual in the sense that people who had, um, uh, you know, an education, so they were, had had an education, were informed by uh, Western trends, and uh, they they could actually um, discuss these ideas uh, among themselves. So it was localized. It was urban, perhaps at first, but then some of these intellectuals traveled into traveled to the countryside actually and uh, tried to to rally some uh, peasants and uh, some people living in the countryside uh, to their their ideas too. So. It was not necessarily, it was originally perhaps more urban, but uh, it did travel and, you know, spread into some, uh, all over the country, actually, and even in in some of the, the colonies, you could find these people uh, represented. So, mm. um, yeah. Let's see. So these intellectuals and the people they inspired, um, how do they express the sense and what were the dangers for people who opposed government policy? Um, well, 
in my in my own research, I've been focusing on expressions of dissent present in all sorts of uh, written sources, so pamphlets, periodicals, posters, poems, novels, plays, and uh, in fact, you you can find fascinating documents in private and public archives all the time and all over the country still. Um, some pamphlets were printed in on clandestine press. Some uh, periodicals were distributed and their sales halted by the police and so forth. Um, the censorship uh, and, and punishment took various various forms too. Some of the, the poems I analyzed had, for example, neat little circles replacing offensive kanji. And this is an example of self-censorship because the authors knew very well that they couldn't uh, use certain word, uh, critical of the emperor, for example, critical of private property. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, instead of saying something critical, um, they would uh, hide the offensive words uh, and let the reader guess what these words were. Um, but they, you know, there are so many cases of writers um, arrested for their ideas, sent to prison, uh, and there's a, a couple, I mean, a few famous cases of uh, writers who lost their lives, of course. The proletarian uh, novelist Kobayashi Takeji, um, he was a well -no is a well-known victim of police brutality in the early 1930s. He wrote uh, novels, and one of these novels denounced the exploitation of workers on fishing boats off the coast of Hokkaido. Uh, but also, in that, this is, these were proletarian novels, so he was openly calling uh, through the novel for uh, collective action and, and communist unity. And so that was, of course, not very well received. Mm. Yes. Um, you've mentioned anarchism a few times already. Um, was that an important political movement in Japan during the modern period? Um, anarchism as a relatively coherent set of ideas appeared in Japan at the time of the Russo-Japanese War, so 1904-1905, or, or perhaps just after. And I wouldn't say it was important in the sense of being widely representative of dissenting politics. It was not a broad-based movement. And uh, the people who claimed to be anarchists, uh, as I said, were for the most part intellectuals who had been um, in contact with foreign radicals and ideas. But but I think that the study of Japanese anarchism is important. Of course, I, I haven't done it. I won't say the, the opposite. But but it's important for, for what it tells us about the tensions of modernization I was referring to earlier. The, the anarchist critique of the state directly targeted the kind of thought control and government oppression that were characteristic of the period. The anarchists themselves promoted instead a way of life that was based on cooperation and mutual aid and sometimes suggesting a return to the values of the traditional village community. So the, the anarchist project in itself may have been utopian. I personally think it was. But the, the anti-coercive mindset it put forward stood apart from other dissenting trends. Uh, and that's why I think it's important. And over the 20th century, interest in Marxism has swamped anarchism, uh, basically taken over. But it could be that its time will come again. And certainly during the late Meiji and Taisho period, uh, it had some adherence in Japan and, and for very good reasons. This may seem a bit slightly off topic, but uh, you talked about this sort of this sense of utopia uh, with a focus on traditional village values. This is something we see often in Japanese media today about this romanticization of the inaka, the countryside, and uh, you know encouraging people to return and to live a simple life in, that, in the village. Do you think there's any sort of trace to that to this movement? Well, um, you know there are some figures of um, pre-modern uh, and modern Japan that were uh, that have been important in the the understanding that the Japanese have of their, their you know their cultural roots and they uh, I'm thinking about someone like Nino Yasontoku who was on the side of peasants of the peasants and uh, uh, you know you know the the thing to keep in mind about Japan is that even though it was uh, industrializing and industrializing fast, uh, 
the proportion of uh, agricultural act, um, activity was uh, very high compared to what uh, there was in England, for example. So, you know, the, the number of people still living uh, off uh, agriculture, fisheries uh, and, and forestry was, was high for a very long time. Um, and so this tradition is very strong. And as we know, there is a sense of, um, the, the, you know, the role of the village in the pre-modern period was very important. Uh, and even during the modernization period, the, the village, it took a long time before it lost its, re even though the, you know, there was an, a real effort on the part of the state, the, the central uh, government to to centralize everything, uh, it took a while for the village to lose its its appeal and, and some of its influence. So um, I think it, it has remained important, perhaps in the, the collective uh, understanding of, of the Japanese. Uh, you've also translated poetry referring to the lives of the Ainu, the native people of Hokkaido, during the pre-war period. How does that relate to political descent? Well, I, I came across uh, some poems written in the late 1920s and 30s by Sarashina Genzo, and he was a, a Japanese political dissenter critical of the central government, questioned by police on a couple of occasions. He was fired from his job as a school teacher because of his subversive ideas. But what is interesting about Sarashina is that he was also very close to the Ainu, the indigenous people of northern Japan. Um, as we know, the Japanese government incorporated Hokkaido, the island, the northern island of Hokkaido, into the national territory in 1869. And it imposed gradually a policy of assimilation of the Ainu. And Sarashina's poems are interesting because they use many words in the Ainu language and give a voice to these indigenous people. So you have poems where an Ainu elder laments about the slyness of the occupiers, the Japanese, or the fact that his people are given land of the poorest quality, land on which they were fishing and hunting in the past, but that had been appropriated by the Japanese government. And you have poems about Ainu school children wondering about the way their history is being taught at school. So the, these poems are very subtle in tone and content, mm -hmm. and they make clear that modernization is not detrimental to everyone, including the colonized, but that the Ainu deserve to be heard. I see. Got lots of questions I'd love to ask about that, but we're running a bit short on time, so I have to move forward. Um, how useful is uh, intellectual history for the student of modern Japan? Hmm. Well, I think it's important to have a broad understanding of what intellectual history is. We, we tend to think that ideas are rigid, that they form a framework for action and serve as the primary motor for people's behavior. But what my research on modern Japan has taught me is that ideas do not exist in a vacuum for people, for them to apply them in real life. Ideas are not rigid. They are constantly being shaped and reshaped by how people, how historical actors understand them and give them some value in their daily life. So often ideas also are used to rationalize actions rather than motivate them. Mm -hmm. So to your question, how useful is intellectual history for the student of modern Japan? Well, I think that by looking at the interplay between people and ideas, we learn not to take everything for granted. And perhaps it makes us better aware that the forces that shaped modern Japan were complex and in constant flux. So with that in mind, modern Japan has an international image of uh, political stability and conformity. So how does your research reconcile with this? Well, that, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, um, I tend to think about your question in terms of post-war Japan, actually, because we, we have indeed this image of political stability um, that Japan enjoys nowadays and, and that is mostly deserved, actually. Japan has been a stable democracy for over 70 years. And 
that doesn't mean that the country didn't experience any conflict during the post-war period. Um, you know, violent demonstrations at the time of the renewal of the security treaty in the 1960s. Uh, and there has been sporadic resistance to the government's handling of various issues that cannot be discounted. But overall, I think we have to recognize that the long-term hold of power by the current Liberal Democratic Party, the party of Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, has helped to maintain some kind of political stability. I'm not sure, however, that the image of image of conformity about Japan conveyed by international media meets the reality. In Western thinking, conformity has a pejorative connotation, and I think that conformity is often used as a substitute for the kind of collective mindset at work in Japan. This mindset is puzzling to Westerners because they tend to prize uh, individualism and, and non-conformism instead. You, you only have to look at international press reports and trends on social media about the handling of the pandemic, actually, to see how puzzling Japan is still to the West. First, Japan was ridiculed early on when it gave a flawed response to coronavirus infections on the Diamond Princess cruise ship docked in Yokohama Harbor back in January. Then it was accused of hiding the number of infections in order to save the Olympic Games. Pundits then predicted an explosive rate of infections and deaths. But uh, Japan is now out of trouble. It has contained the disease without a full lockdown and economic life is resuming almost as normal. So the interesting fact is that support rating for the government has fallen to very low level. I was uh, mm. in Japan for the whole of the so-called lockdown and, and it was interesting to see how people interpreted it after their own fashion. Um, they by no means stuck to every government prescription, but used their own common sense. People acted reasonably, even creatively, and in what I see as a real collective spirit and without waiting for the government guidelines to do so. So it, it's a it's a fascinating puzzle. Definitely. It's intriguing how much this uh, issues of today can be uh, drawn from ideas of intellectual history. Um, I think that's all we've got time for this week. Thank you, Nadine, so much for showing us through a fascinating research and uh, hopefully we'll be able to have you on the show soon. Well, thank you for having me. To find out more about Nadine's research, you can see her research profile in the description below or follow her on Twitter for her latest findings. Join us next week when I'll be joined by Dr. Eugenia Bogdanova-Kuma, lecturer in Japanese Arts, Cultures and Heritage, at the Sainsbury Institutes for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures to discuss post-war avant-garde calligraphy from Japan. Thank you for listening.